Cassandra Tate, um, this book is many years in the works for her. She's also the author of the book, or a first book, a wonderful book called Cigarette Wars. She was a, herself was a journalist for many years. And then um, at, after doing that work, went and took a PhD in history at the University of Washington, I think um, attaining that about 25 years ago. And she has been a Neiman fellow at Harvard. So she has, she's gone East, um, but she's here in Seattle. And um, we are delighted that she tonight will finally get to talk about this, which I think started as a, piece, a series of pieces for History Link, which she's written in, and which is a, a valuable um, and invaluable part of how history is chronicled in this part of the country. Enough of me. So um, thank you all very much for coming. And now, Cassandra Tate and John Hughes. Thank you both. Thank you, Rick. John? Hey, the coincidence couldn't be more auspicious because this afternoon, Governor Inslee signed the bipartisan bill that had worked its way through the legislature to replace the statue of Marcus Whitman in the National Statuary Gallery with one of Billy Frank Jr., whom I knew well in the 1970s when I covered the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. And, and notably, that legislation was achieved without trashing the Whitmans. And Cassandra's book, to be certain, in an era of knee-jerk cancel culture is not equal time for the alleged savages. It's an even-handed account of a, a tragedy that unfolded on the American frontier. And it, it really stands out to me for its even-handedness. Uh, early on when I joined the Office of the Secretary of State, I met George Scott, a Seattle historian and former legislator, and I told him, gee, I, I wish I had gone for a PhD. And he said, no, no, don't do that. That'll, they'll pasteurize all the talent out of you. Well, I'm here to tell you that Cassandra Tate can really write and has a PhD. She's the best of both worlds. She, she, to her craft, she brings storytelling and that rigor, the academic rigor of painstaking attention to detail. So what we've got here with this book that I think ought to be required reading in every secondary school Washington State history class in college, uh, Washington State history class, we have a book that combines storytelling with factual history, sorting through the lurid imaginary accounts that canonize these missionaries, and uh, I believe arrives at some really remarkable truths. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Cassandra Tate. And it's my pleasure to be here with John Hughes, who's, who's a wonderful writer and researcher and like me, a uh, recovering uh, journalist. Um, as John mentioned, uh, just, just a few hours ago, uh, Jay, our governor, Jay Inslee, signed uh, a bill that will uh, send Marcus Whitman um, into uh, maybe you know, a hall of fallen heroes or a hall of yesterday's heroes, but he'll be evicted from Statuary Hall eventually. Um, I thought I would start by reading a little bit from my introduction, which focuses on that statue. Um, if, if you haven't seen it, it uh, it's really, I think, one of the best statues in the, in the whole collection. And every state gets two statues in Statuary Hall. And uh, I, I love Marcus. I love the statue of the mythical Marcus Whitman. Um, and... Uh, let me share what I've written. Marcus Whitman was a Protestant missionary who might have been only a historical footnote had not he, his wife Narcissa, and 11 others been killed by Cayuse Indians during an attack on his mission near present day Walla Walla, Washington in 1847. Instead, he became one of the most memorialized figures in, in the Northwest. A county, a college, a national forest, half a dozen public schools, and numerous other enterprises, from an upscale hotel in Walla Walla to a church in Des Moines, carry his name. The Washington legislature once considered a measure to rename Mount Rainier in his honor. His former mission is a National Historic Site. His statue stands in the National Statuary Hall in the Capitol Building in Washington, DC. Nine feet 
of gleaming bronze on a seven ton block of polished granite depicting a muscular buckskin clad frontiersman with a ripped torso and linebacker thighs. He appears to be striding resolutely along an unbroken trail, one foot higher than the other, buckskin fringe and kerchief flying, a Bible in one hand, saddlebags and a scroll in the other. His strong jaw is neatly bearded, his flowing locks topped by a beaver skin hat, if the National Statuary Hall had a hunk contest, he'd be the winner, hands down. Memory and story and history and fact have a fluid relationship. Heroes rise and fall to the rhythms of what scholars call the politics of memory. New facts are revealed, old ones dissected, and stories reshaped and sometimes forgotten altogether as political and social conditions change. The initial narrative or memory about the Whitmans as, as told by whites emphasized their religiosity. It reflected the evangelical values of dominant voices in the mid 19th century a time of intense religious revivalism in the United States. By the end of the century, after two major economic crises and associated political and social upheavals, a new version of the story had emerged. Grounded in nostalgia for an idealized past, it celebrated the Whitmans as heroic pioneers who helped a young, expansionist nation realize its dreams of manifest destiny. A competing narrative, one that included the voices and perspective, uh, perspectives of the Cayuse and other indigenous peoples began to develop in the late 1960s. Books such as D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and films such as Soldier Blue and Little Big Man helped foster public interest in uncovering the history of the West from Indian points of view. In the 1980s, the National Park Service, which operates the Whitman Mission National Historic Site, stopped commemorating the annual anniversary of the attack, redesigned its displays to give more attention to the Cayuse and a more balanced assessment of their interactions with, with the uh, Whitmans and phased out the use of the word massacre in favor of more neutral language. The word appeared five times in a four page brochure distributed by the Park Service in the late 1950s. In contrast, it was not used at all in brochures available in 1997, the 150th anniversary of what instead was called the tragedy at Today, the tendency is to see the Indians, not the missionaries, as the martyrs. We seem to live in a binary world where the lines between good and bad are clearly drawn without much room for nuance. For more than a century after their deaths, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman were venerated by non-Indians as heroic pioneers who had given their lives to bring Christianity and civilization to the West. In more recent years, they've been demonized as cultural imperialists and agents of genocide. They received too much credit in the first instance and too much blame in the second. They were complicated, imperfect people, idealistic, but culturally arrogant. They were courageous, but inflexible. And it was the way they died more than the way they lived that guaranteed them a place in the history of the Northwest. You know, Cassandra, that cultural arrogance is uh, something I learned uh, about early on as a young reporter covering the Quinault Nation 
I think I told you earlier that one of the defining moments of my life was when I was 10 years old in 1953, uh, returning from the Pendleton Roundup with my aunt and uncle and stopping at Celilo to watch the Indians. For, all, for We stayed for hours and it was just mesmerizing to see these ancient traditions of the Indians, men and women alike out on these long, uh, long uh, sort of gangway-like planks suspended out over the, the, the falls and uh, dipping and spearing uh, the fish. And the stories that I heard, uh, I, I so vividly remember uh, doing a story about the hereditary chief of the Quinault Nation and that same day, we attended an Indian shaker service that I'd never, I'd never been to one before for a tribal elder. And the chanting and the singing derivative of, of mixing sort of um, Catholic Christianity with Indian spiritualism was just the most haunting, mesmerizing experience. And the, that was Jim Jackson, Jug Jackson, the chief of the Quinaults, and he he. He turned to me as we were going out the door and he said, it's not easy being an Indian Christian. <laughs> and I thought about all that I'd learned from my 10 year old eyes being open to the, what had been happening for eons, these traditional um, ways of life to, to taking courses at the University of Washington from, for, from Bill Holm one summer about Northwest Coast Indian art and then learning about the efforts by the, as you put it so well, the well-meaning but myopic missionaries to rinse all the Indianness out of the Indians, to, to make them stop speaking their language, cut their hair, to dress differently, to abandon their, their rich oral traditions. Um, I think that's something that you've done really skillful in this book, again, is to, is to, um, is to make certain that the idealism of the of the the Whitmans, and it's contrasted with the this proud band, the Cayuse. They, they they were horse people. They traded all over the Northwest. They had this mobility, uh, trading with all different tribes and some of the Boston's and the Hudson's Bay people. I, I thought that was really mesmerizing. Uh, what you did in sketching out so carefully the contrast of the collision of these two cultures. That must have been difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Um, it was a challenge. As uh, I think that a major challenge was to parse out Indian perspectives on what had happened 150 plus years ago. Um, as I tried to explain in the book. The Cayuse, like other indigenous peoples, didn't have a written language. Um, they recorded their history and their stories um, orally. And that oral chain was broken by, um, by, the, attack, by the aftermath of the attack on the mission. Um, one of my primary um, sources for, for the Indian perspective in this book was Roberta Connor, the director of the Tamasklet um, Cultural Institute, which is um, the only, it's located on uh, tribal land near Pendleton. It's the only tribally owned museum. It tells the story of Western expansionism from the Indian point of view. And Roberta told me that because there was shame associated for the Cayuse um, with that attack, they were pilloried, um, persecuted, and, um, and, and carried that uh, badge of shame through some generations. So they didn't talk about it. You know, growing up, she never, she never heard stories about the women's. Um, or what had happened at, at Wailapu. It was something to just be set aside, moved on from. And now, interestingly enough, um, that's, that's shifting. Um, she told me that in uh, tribal meetings now, the annual meetings, uh, when people are asked to uh, the, the Cayuse, of course, have been uh, relegated to a reservation with um, 
that they share with the Umatilla and Walla Walla peoples. And at the beginning of the annual meetings, people are asked uh, to identify themselves with one uh, or the other of these, of these tribal groups. And hardly anybody used to raise their hand for the Cayuse. And now you look around and you see many, many hands raised, people claiming Cayuse heritage. Um, and uh, the whole re-examination of the Whitman story and the attack on the mission, parsing the reasons for the attack, trying to create a more nuanced and, and complicated uh, history of what happened there. Um, with, uh, with with all that, it's uh, it's it's just becoming, um, you know, not so much a, a thing of shame, but uh, a heritage to claim. And I think the tribe right now um, has would, would really like to repatriate the remains of the five Cayuse who were hung in connection with the attack um, uh, in 1850. Nobody knows where exactly they were buried. And it would be, um, you know, a, 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 a coda for the tribe to repatriate those remains and, and give them a proper burial. You know, Roberta says something really powerful at the beginning of chapter three, where you, where you quote her. She says, these people who came west to civilize the heathen, what made them decide to do that? To me, it's completely irrational to go into somebody else's country and try to tell them how to think, how to pray, how to how to live, how to raise their children. I mean, the we. I'm so annoyed by the the cancer culture. It real to me. It really is knee jerk. We're in, in these things take on uh, the speed of light on YouTube and other social media, and the next thing you know, there there goes another statue. But notably in this case, thanks to your book and. Uh, some real common sense on part on part of both indigenous peoples and historians and presumably I guess that's a good question are there Whitman descendants who've had anything to say about uh, this re revisiting of history and uh, the decision to remove the the statue no it hasn't come from uh, descendants of the women they uh, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman had only one child and and that uh, child a, a daughter uh, drowned when she was uh, that's right that's less, right less than three years old uh, but um, that statue was um, created by a Salt Lake City a sculptor an artist named um, Avard Fairbanks I think is that his name? Anyway, I know I know that that his his descendants are very proud of that statue and are very upset by the um, move by the move to forklift it out of the out of the U.S. Capitol and have said, in fact, you know, well, if you people in the Washington don't want it, you know, bring it to us, you know, we'll put it outside uh, with the Wasatch range behind it and, and, and pay tribute to both the uh, noble man and, and a great work of art. Whitman's descendants, um, no, no, they maintain radio silence. Hmm. It's hard to find uh, people these days who really defend um, the, the missionary et ethic. Um, and yeah, like I've said, um, you know, today you, you, we frown more on the, on the missionaries than on, than on the Indians. Well, the fact is that the, the Whitmans were not unique in any way in their evangel in evangelism. They, they definitely, the idealists that they were, Christian idealists that they were, they believed that they had a great mission from Jesus Christ to go out and, and save uh, the savages, to bring them to civilization and the, the promise of salvation. And so the... You, there's not too big a distinction to be uh, made between uh, the Puritans, um, the these missionaries of the 19th century, and no less a light than uh, Sir Thomas More, who resigned a lot of shrieking Lutherans to be burned at the stake. I mean, there's this 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 fervor that powers everything, and it, it's. It, 
today through today's lens the notion of salvation without any empathy or cultural um, sensitivity to whatever peoples you're dealing with i mean it, it's it's pretty provocative stuff. But again, I have to go back to the fact that I was really proud to see that throughout this debate over the statue, and after all, we should remember, with all due respect to the sculpture, this is tremendously idealized, as you pointed out in your reading. Uh, the, the notion that, that Marcus Whitman really looked like a cross between Schwarzenegger and, and, and uh, Davy Crockett is pretty far-fetched stuff. So. I guess I think you don't think you should be rendered that large unless you were Lincoln or someone of his statue. But today we know that Abraham Lincoln in the in what in San Francisco school district was being pilloried for um, hanging some Indians, no less. So there you go. The one thing that I tried to do in in my book is look at the motivations of both. The, the missionaries and the, the Cayuse who initially welcomed, in fact, the Northwest tribes competed to have missionaries establish um, outposts on their, on their land. You know, what did the Indians want out of that exchange? What did the missionaries want? You know, it's, a trans, it's transactional. Um, and, and, and I must say too, that both cultures are, are equally foreign to me. You know, I, I'm as far outside missionary culture as I am outside the culture of indigenous peoples in the mid 19th century. Um, having said that, you know, you know, using the, the best tools that I had and, you know, my best understanding is that there's an element of aggrandizement, self-aggrandizement in the missionary impulse. Yes, they were genuinely concerned about the fate of the souls of these um, unchurched people and, and, and really horrified by the idea that, they, that those unsaved souls were going to burn in hell forever. It was, it was something that was real, palatable to them and, and, and they wanted to help as many of those Indians avoid that dreadful fate as they could. At the same time, they get uh, the, the self-aggrandizement comes from the way uh, their, their peers react to them. Missionaries at the time were celebrated people and, and the Whitmans and the missionaries who came after them they made that arduous journey across the country. They stopped all along the way until they got past, you know, the Missouri River. Um, they stopped at these little towns. Each town had a little church and they would give us, you know, a little talk in the church and raise a little money. And, and they would be sent on their way with congratulations and, and uh, goodwill and, and, um, acknowledgement. So they're getting this sort of, you know, positive feedback from their peers. And, you know, maybe some also some personal comfort in knowing that they were doing God's work and that that when they got to heaven themselves, or when they came to, you know, the point of departure, that 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 God would smile upon them for making these these efforts. It's, you know, it's just a complicated thing to, you know, we hardly can understand why we do things are in our own lives uh, and to um, try to understand why people in the past did things is, is a challenge. And, but I, um, I also, you know, I think that that looking at, at, at the past from, you know, a, a more open lens. You see the complexity of it. You see how tangled it is, but it's a more interesting picture than a simple black and white binary picture. Those people were bad. These people were good. We're going to, you know, condemn these people and celebrate these people. It's a simplistic view of history 
is not as interesting or you know, nourishing as looking at the, the more complex picture. Well, there's certainly, there's no discounting the courage of those pioneer women. We were talking earlier, I said that I had followed in the story of another woman, the third white woman to cross the Rockies. And in your book, which is, uh, there's just marvelous detail about the travails of the pioneers crossing uh, into the Oregon country and the women uh, in particular, uh, Garrison Keeler put it best, they, they were brave and, and, and resourceful. During the, the crossing, Narcissa becomes pregnant. In Europe, she would fight nausea and increasing discomfort as her pregnancy progressed, but at least it meant an end to the challenges associated with menstruation, including finding the time and privacy to change and wash the rags. I mean, the women in my family, daughters and wife are in that were just in awe of, the, of, of how terrible that must have been and the, the lack of privacy and the indignity. And, I, and throughout this book, the from uh, women riding side saddle to the provisions that they had that I mean, it, and then the Narcissa wrote that the, the, the Indian ladies would come and stand around our tent, peep in and grin in their astonishment to see such looking objects. I, f I find all that detail just absolutely uh, remarkable. And I thought in the beginning when I read this book, and I, I told you that I thought that you'd made a mistake by starting off with the killings. And then I realized, like a great storyteller, like Truman Capote or Robert Carroll, that by getting to the to to, to that the beginning first, it allowed you in the narrative to tell not only what came afterward, but how we got there. I thought that was really wonderful what you did. But above all, I think that this book works on so many fronts. It works as a historical revisiting of such a complex thing, the, the evangelism, manifest destiny, and all the commercial aspects of that, seizing uh, the notion that God meant us from sea to shining sea to make the world safe for American commerce, Never mind the savages, but then the idealism of the people and and this collision of cultures. I, I wish you would really tell us about something that I think is is so crucial to this book, and that is um, the issue of malpractice. To use a modern term for uh, for what to the Indians must have seemed like retribution for bad doctoring. When I started to investigate the the, the history of the Indians, the coastal Indians. I talked to an old Quinault storyteller who told me that in the 1860s, that hundreds of Indians near Westport, today's Westport, suffering from smallpox and so feverish, they hurled themselves into the surf and died of exposure and drowning. And the, the, what the Indians really didn't count on, they certainly the, were looking for firearms and beads and chisels and all the other blessing cloth and the blessings that the, that the um, settlers brought, but they didn't expect measles and diphtheria and all these other things. What was the, what, what transpired between Dr. Whitman and the Cayuse with regard to this issue of of malpractice. So I think, you know, you're getting at the question of why did the Cayuse attack the mission? Um, there was a measles outbreak. Um, it's really hard to say how, um, how many um, Indians died, but probably a third of, I mean, best guess is a third of the uh, Cayuse who were living uh, near the, the mission. Um, and most of them were uh, children who died. And we have contemporary accounts from uh, visitors, uh, whites who visited um, and recorded what they saw, the suffering of the, of the Indians and their bafflement, you know, what is, you know, what is causing these horrible this horrible plague, what is the cause? Uh, Marcus Whitman had been presented to the Cayus 11 years earlier as a healer of great power. And um, that's part of the reason why he was, why the indigenous peoples 
in the plot on the plateau were were interested in him and, and welcomed him and, and his wife. So he's that's that's the initial, you know, their initial understanding of who he was was he he's a physician, he's a healer. And they had the in plateau people, not just the Cayuse, but others as well, had a long-standing tradition of viewing the healing arts as something that involved uh, spiritual and power, as well as uh, you know, knowledge of, uh, of practical knowledge, but that a, a good healer was somebody who could marshal spiritual power for good to rid, rid the, the body of whatever mal uh, influences were making that body sick. If a healer misused that power, then the, the person would get sick. So the healer had the power either to cure or to um, sicken. And a healer who was misusing his or her power and sickening his or her patients was somebody who was misusing their power and they needed to be put to death. And that is one of the factors clearly that influenced the attack on the Whitman mission. Marcus Whitman had presented himself as somebody who could cure disease and here was disease that was carrying off young people, children by the scores and he was helpless. And for the most part, um, he, his white patients, and this was a measles outbreak that affected whites as well as Indians, his white patients tended to recover and his Indian patients tended to die. We know now with our understanding of germ theory and, and virology that the Caucasian people over millennia had developed uh, some degree of herd immunity to diseases such as measles um, and other contagious diseases. The indigenous, indigenous people not living in crowded conditions um, did not develop the same kind of herd immunity to those pathogens. So um, Marcus Whitman, Whitman's white patients tended to survive despite his treatments because he was giving the same treatments to both the indigenous people and the white people. And they consisted of, you know, his medical arsenal at the time, bleeding uh, and, and administering uh, agents that would make the people poop or vomit. Um, in other words, you know, they're being dehydrated at the very time that they, you know, need more fluid. Um, but, you know, white people tended to survive and the Indian people tended to, to uh, not. And naturally it would be, you know, the object of suspicion and um, a pogrom falls on the man who said he was a healer and who wasn't healing. And Narcissa sometimes dispensed medicines in Marcus's absence. He was gone uh, very frequently on long trips. And she would sometimes administer potions to the Indians. So she would too, she too would have an aura of uh, being a healer. Um, and then, you know, that's one element I think in the attack. Um, there's also just the, the flood of, of immigrants who were coming through um, along the Oregon Trail. It's, it's Marcus and Narcissa Whitman did not themselves lead the first wagon train. They did not travel in a covered wagon, but they established an outpost that became an important rest stop for um, immigrants who were traveling in covered wagons later. Um, 
and they they actually tended to be the the people in the later years who stopped by the Whitman mission tended to be the people who were the poorest and the sickest and the least equipped of those who were making that passage. But in any case, um, there are just floods of these white people moving through Cayuse land, using up scarce resources, using up, that's an arid land, there's not, you know, there's, basically treeless and so using up very scarce firewood and um, and driving herds of animals that ate um, the grasses that were needed to um, support Cayuse horse herds. You know, John, as you mentioned, the Cayuse were great horse, horse people and had vast herds of horses. And now, you know, their horses are not able to graze in places that that they were accustomed to grazing because the, uh, of these white people and their uh, cattle and, and mules um, who were passing through and using up, that, using up that grass. So that's an element to just sort of, um, you know, resentment and uh, look, you know, you, you, you said you were gonna bring us good things and you're just bringing us bad things. And so, uh, in that you know uh, explosion of, of violence, um, killed the Whitmans, and they killed adult. Well, they considered adult men, immigrant men, uh, who were winter uh, settling into winter at the mission. Were, was there any kind of uh, in that era among the missionaries, and I, 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 I imagine there weren't many like uh, Marcus who were both uh, uh, evangelists and, and medical people. Was there any feedback in the East about the, the dangers of the, of the lack of immunity on the part of the, the natives out West? Uh, none of that. Not that I'm aware of, no. There, um, there was very little attention given to the actual needs and wants and, and practices of the indigenous people. It was, um, Go you know, save them. we're the, yeah, we're, we're going to bring you, uh, we're going to bring you the Bible and we're going to bring you uh, civilization. We're going to teach you how to, how to live like white people. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, the Whitman's themselves were, completely unaware and, and uninterested in Cayuse culture. Uh, they could have learned a lot from the Indians if they had, you know, been a little more open to them. But on, they, uh, every year on Columbus Day, one of my Quinault friends would call me at my office at the newspaper and, and be, begin with these words, you will forgive me, my Caucasian friend, for not wishing you well on this day. And I thought that that was a, a really important wake up call. Cassandra, uh, did you ever find different accounts of the events that occurred? And if so, how did you distinguish the most reliable? I mean, what was, I guess, your research and what, what how much, you know, how many different accounts and how, how did you work through that? I tried to, to make, it, make it clear in, in my book that, um, you know, this person says, said that and it was at you know at a certain point in time. Maybe it was something that the person wrote twenty years later. Something that the person had experienced as a as a, a child and was trying to recall, you know, revisit it many many years later. Um, I, I, you know, John, you you mentioned the the structure of the book that I started with the the um, attack. Why did I do that? I, I had that in mind right from the beginning, actually, that I, I would want the, I wanted to get that out of the way. And I also wanted to try to show, show my readers that you have to look at, look at the source material with a, a skeptical eye and put it into context. Um, so some things that are just so minor, like what time did it start? Was it 1230? Was it one o'clock? Was it two o'clock? What time of day? You know, you, 
people had different wrote different accounts. So um, how you know who was shot and how, how who was shot and who was sta uh, bludgeoned? Um, what happened during the captivity? How um, <laughs> the que the question is you know how do you decide what is true? I think you just use your, you know, use your intuition to a degree. You, you, I cast a wide net and reel in all this stuff and then try to weigh and measure, you know, um, do, does this make sense? How, how reliable could this person's memory be when she is writing, you know, 40 years later about something that happened to her when she was 10? Um, it's, I guess it's, you know, it's just, you have to ride along with me and, and note, you know, I'm where I've made conclusions that are my own and where I've tried to establish as best I could what the facts were. You know, it's, it's a, this conflict between what is fact and what is interpretation. Um, you try to get as clear a picture of the facts as you can, and then use your your you know your best judgment to make an interpretation about what those facts mean. And that's what I, I tried to do. And like all good historians, Cassandra Tate's work is carefully source noted. So if if you want to, you can look it up, as they say in in baseball. You you can see what her her original and derivative sources are that propel this narrative. I looked at several of those sources because I I, I told Cassandra th this afternoon that, that I read this book again in practically one sitting over the weekend for a second time and looked at those source notes again. I get the privilege of getting to work at the, the Washington State Library where there, there's amazing resources, but it is very fastidiously done. I think that's, the, that's what really characterized this book, that we have here a really talented writer who is also has the, the, the training of a PhD historian to bring a rigor to this book. Um. What sparked your interest to write to even bring this to, to book form into what to, to the story? It's it's, it's my OCD <laughs> in nature. Um, yeah, it's it's it started with one small article for HistoryLink.org, and for all of you out there who don't know about HistoryLink, I I hope you'll check it out. It's an online encyclopedia of Washington State history, and I'm proud to have been associated with it almost from the beginning. Um, and so I was asked to, the encyclopedia has two different kinds of articles, one long form um, essays, and then shorter pieces that are called timeline, timeline um, pieces. And this, I was asked to, to redo the timeline entry that was on the encyclopedia um, about the attack. And I think it was originally just, you know, um, on November 27th, uh, uh, 1847, uh, Indians attack the Whitman mission in the Whitman massacre, et cetera. So I just, I updated that article. I rewrote that article. That was kind of the beginning. It prompted uh, in my own memories of having heard this story when I was uh, in elementary school in Seattle. And, you know, it a, was a part of the standard Washington State uh, public school curriculum. You had Absolutely. to learn something about the Whitman massacre and quote unquote. Um, and I remember the story that I was introduced to at that at, at, at that time. I, I loved this. I loved the story that I heard, which was you know, the mean nasty Indians uh, attacked the saintly um, um, missionaries and slaughtered the people who tried to save them, etc. Um, I I all you know, and then I I got the other another 
version of that story when I was living in um, Lewiston, Idaho and working for a newspaper there, not far away from a mission that was established by Henry and Eliza Spalding, who the missionary couple who came west with the Whitmans. Um, and by that time, uh, you know, the, the emphasis had shifted. There was more interest in looking, as I've said, looking at um, this history from an Indian point of view. And I just became interested in the way the story had changed over time, which was just, just means the way we were looking at that story, how it had changed. So um, I just followed one strand after another. Um, and the, yeah, next thing I knew, I, I was a decade older. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it, it really began with that one little, um, I don't know, thousand word essay. Uh, could you please say again, the name of the tribal owned museum you mentioned? It's the Tamasklet Cultural Institute. It's a wonderful museum. As I said, the only tribally owned museum, the only museum to tell the story of Western expansionism from a tribal perspective. Cassandra, are there mu any museums with Whitman exhibits or artifacts? Narcissa Whitman's childhood home um, was purchased by a Presbyterian group some years ago. Uh, that's in, um, in upstate New York. This group bought, bought her house, uh, bought, bought, you know, bought the house where she had grown up. She was born in that house, actually. They moved it to another site and uh, reopened it as a museum uh, to the public. And there are all kinds of Whitman um, memorabilia and artifacts in there, including a copy of the, a very idealized portrait of Narcissa as a, 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 a beautiful blonde. I, I call it the brick girl portrait, very idealized. I think with, with each retelling of, of that story for a while, Narcissa got to be, more blonde and more beautiful and, and Marcus, you know, more handsome and, and rugged. But um, of course, the Whitman Mission National Historic Site has, for example, some of the, um, of the dishes that were recovered from the mission site. There was an archeological um, excavation of the mission site in the 1950s, I think, and they recovered some things like a compass that it is believed uh, he left behind when he made uh, a midwinter ride back east uh, to try to get permission to continue operating his, his mission. But so yeah, uh, at, at Walla Walla, the National um, Historic Site, they've um, that's out on the outskirts of Walla Walla. They have a lot of uh, Whitman mem memorabilia there. And also it's interesting to go to uh, Fort Vancouver, the uh, Fort Vancouver National Historic Site, because Fort Vancouver in the time when the Whitmans lived was uh, really the, the center of, it was, it was the urban center, it was, it was a multicultural center, and it was where you went to do all your shopping. Um, so that's also very interesting to see that. What was the most surprising thing for you um, that you uncovered or something you didn't, you weren't expecting to learn to the degree you were expecting certain things? I think that uh, I, I didn't really appreciate the depth of Narcissa Whitman's grief after her uh, daughter drowned. Um, Narcissa Whitman was a good writer. Uh, I, you know, she could have had a completely different kind of life if she had just been born a generation later. But um, her, many of her letters home have survived. And to read what she wrote about the death of her daughter, she held, held that toddler's body in her arms for four days until you know decomposition had just set in, and she, and in her words, you know, she was melting. Um, I think that because that um, put a, a human 
face on you know what uh, on this on this person. Um, I think I was also surprised by the evidence that the that the Indians wanted these people to come, and, and now why did they want the people to come? And pro probably one, uh, you know, human motives are always complicated anyway, but we never act, you know, out of one impulse alone. Um, and I think one thing that they were interested in was they, they wanted competition for the Hudson's Bay Company, which was, you know, uh, ran all of the um, commerce uh, uh, in the West. Uh, and they could, the Indians wanted, I think, some competition so that they could bargain more with the, with the Hudson's Bay people for, um, you know, how many, you know, how many of this do I have to give you in order to get this thing that I want, this object, you know, they, they really valued uh, metal goods and woven cloth and weapons, guns, ammunition, that kind of thing. So there's a you know just an element of of good old capitalistic uh, um, competition in there, and also you know it's just a kind of a, a status thing. Um, got these new people here, and they have these new things. And I, by all accounts, the Cayuse and other Indians were very curious about um, you know other ways of living, interested in them other ways of living and other ways of thinking, um, not to the point of giving up completely, you know, their own ways of thinking and ways of living, but, you know, to, to, to be an amalgamator, take what they found useful. So that was, um, I yeah. kept being surprised actually all along the way. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for this conversation. And ask a question about how this was covered in the press in those days, both Northwest, like newspapers, um, and back East, um, in the time it took to get this reported. Well, um, the missionary's progress was um, um, was was covered. You know, the just little short dispatches from um, you know the the field. Uh, you know, we, we've reached such and such a place today and we um, ate, you know, such and such, that kind of like a little, like travel diaries. Um, and, uh, and that's covered to some degree in the um, secular press and to a greater degree in the religious press. Um, but then the, uh, after the attack, um, the, uh, the hysteria and the, and the um, lurid descriptions of, the, um, of what people thought had happened, you know, like uh, women being scalped, um, raped, uh, just the kind of heavy uh, language that was used, not just in the, um, by that time, the Oregon city was the center of white um, settlement in, in Oregon country. And they had a newspaper and that newspaper, um, you know, just kind of went beside itself in, in talking about this horrible massacre and, and what needed to happen now. Every single one of those Indians needed to be driven off the face of the earth and so on. Um, but um, the dispatches from that newspaper would be picked up and reprinted um, in, in newspapers across the country. So there was enormous coverage given to um, the massacre and, uh, and calls for uh, volunteers to go fight the Indians and avenge um, the deaths. Mm. The detail you bring to the book, to me, is an important view from the view of a woman in the 19th century. I think that I, um, I was um, maybe, yeah, I think I, I, I think I brought a different perspective. I was certainly interested in things like, John, for example, you mentioned um, that 
you know, what I wrote about the um, when Narcissus is pregnant and that's a, you know, difficulty when she's, you know, riding and, uh, or uh, side saddle and twisted and everything, but it meant that she didn't have to bother with her monthly period anymore. I don't, I don't know that a male historian would have um, found that noteworthy. <laughs> um, and uh, I've, I just gained some sympathy for the women. I mean, the men and the women who, the, the, those pioneers, they, they were really, really tough. And I found things to admire about about them, their self-sufficiency, how, you know, they can do things, they did things that I, you know, that I don't know anybody who can, or, I mean, just having to make everything, um, I, I came to value that about, I guess maybe again, getting back to this whole question of what surprised me, um, that, that I came to have as much uh, sympathy for the missionaries as I, as I did. And I probably came into it with uh, the attitude of, um, you know, you people would have, you, you, you brought diseases, you brought turmoil, um, you uh, were arrogant and, and you should have stayed home. We approached it, you know, from that point of view and um, came to, to find things that were, um, that, you know, that you could, appreciate about those people. Um, thank you both. This, again, back to the reason we're really here tonight, Cassandra's book, Unsettled Ground. The book's been doing well, and I think um, getting attention such as this for it again, but we're delighted um, Cassandra's done this tonight, and um, thank you so much, John, for adding My pleasure. In all the ways. To all of you who are, have been with us, thank you again, and um, congratulations, and, and thank you again, Cassandra. Um, for the marvelous book. Congratulations, thank Cassandra. Thank, thank you both. It's um, it's it's a privilege and an honor, and uh, really glad that that we did this. Uh -huh.